the other gray one. <laughs> <laughs> they come in handy. Check, check. One, two. There we go. Check, check. All righty. Check, check, check. Well, thank you all so much for coming and, and hanging out with us tonight. This is, um, and my goodness, so nice to, to meet you both, Adrian and Amy. This is such a treat for everyone in this room. And Hello, Denver, right? Hello, Colorado. Where else? We have people from Wyoming, I heard before. Anybody else from further away? Oh, you don't talk to them? Yeah. Nebraska. Nebraska, we have Nebraska. Excellent. So. Are, are you familiar with Colorado? Is this the first for you both to, to come to a convention here? First time convention in all of Colorado mm -hmm. and definitely in Denver for sure. Yeah. yeah, I've been here a couple times. Yeah, I've, I've been of course here. skied. You guys do have the best. I actually popped my knee on Winter Park. <laughs> <laughs> my second ACL. Oh, geez. Oh, yeah. Of course, it's always the last run of the day, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, last black diamond I ever saw. <laughs> well, we're thrilled that you're here. Um, as soon as we heard that you were coming, we're like, please let us talk to Adrian and Amy. They're, you know, um, in our minds, the, the proto final girls. And uh, we're really excited to talk to you about both of the, the first two films. Um, Adrian, I was going to start with you. Just we got the first film. Um, I'm curious about how you were cast. For in as the character of Alice, um, and your impressions of the production before any of the legacy, before any of the success, what was your experience approaching Friday the Thirteenth? Well, you have to understand that in New York or in, in anywhere, where, at the time I was in New York City, with it seemed like millions of other actors and actresses who wanted to do the same thing I wanted to do. So, you know, auditions uh, happened every day and you prayed, you know, you get called back or whatever. So I only had a commercial agent at the time and I was doing my Burger King commercials and whatever else at the time, uh, dancing on a 7-Up commercial with tapping with Sammy Davis Jr. I mean, things like this, you know, doing extra work uh, with... On uh, Saturday Night Fever, I danced throughout that entire film. But those are the kind of things you do trying to get to a place where, you know, you actually have your name attached to a character as opposed to an extra or just a dancer or something like that. So it was an open call for a lot of us, uh, three days worth. Every actor and actress, I think, uh, union, non-union showed up at the Minskoff Studios, which is where things happened back in the day. And uh, I got a call back and then another call back. This was the summer of 1979. It took a, quite a while for them to whittle us down into pairs. And then we, you know, we, we tried different arrangements and then we got that settled up, but they didn't know who the final girl was gonna be. And it was down to about six of us. And we all did a screen test and we were down on the floor and in the corner screaming and yelling and because the script was very thin. It wasn't like the only thing that we had in terms of uh, an audition scene was when, uh, you know, the showers, the shower story, <laughs> the only piece of like the only monologue in the yes. whole thing. Yes, so that was our audition scene. You know, I, I dreamt I was in a shower and there were pools of blood. And, um, and uh, that afternoon, I got a call from Sean that I had gotten the part of his first, you know, his, he said, you know, you're our lead. And I said, thank you very much. And we start shooting the day after Labor Day. And, uh, when I got to the set, I had driven up that morning, the day after Labor Day at like 5 a.m. We all met at Columbus Circle, and it was like Kevin and Harry and Ned and Lori. The, who am I missing? Annie wasn't with us. Uh, and so it was, it was that group, and we drove up in a little like panel truck, you know, like yeah. a little shuttle thingy, and we had an hour and a half to two hours to get to know each other better. And we started shooting that 
afternoon, that very afternoon. Oh my and so when I got there, uh, all I can remember is driving up this long, and it's still there if you've ever been back to the camp, long driveway up to the camp. And when we got there, there was this like hustle bustle of all this activity. And to me, that's the best part of being on a film is, you know, that camaraderie and that energy when you first get there and you can feel it in the, in the air that everybody wants something to really happen. And it was such a low, low budget film, and so much was on, uh, so much was on the line for Sean on this one because he literally had his house like mortgaged twice, I think, and I think he was ready to sell the kids, and uh, <laughs> and so you could just feel it, and, and it was a lot of us our first real gig. Kevin had uh, Animal House under his belt already, but for the rest of us, it was like the first time we were actually going to have like a real name in a movie. And, uh, and it was just very exciting. And we were all there to make the best horror movie ever. And that's what it felt like that first day. <laughs> After that, it all changed. <laughs> but we literally, we, we shot that fun scene of everybody running around on the beach. And you see me walk, running two different directions in the same scene, you know. And uh, they didn't waste any film back there. Film was so expensive. And uh, yeah, the whole Netty thing, uh, Rock, Rocky Road and all that, I think, was all that afternoon. So we did a lot of filming quickly, you know, like time is money. Film is expensive. Let's get that done. So that was my, in a nutshell, or in a big nutshell. Uh, <laughs> that's the answer to your question. That's great. No, I, I, and we want to talk more about what it was like making films in this in this period of time. But what I'm really curious about is what was it like for this to be a success? What was it like for you to experience this movie becoming as popular as it was? You know, the experience I think was more important for me at the time because. I honestly didn't think this film was going to make it to the end. <laughs> we kept on running out of money. And, you know, even what we ate was so minimal. And so you could tell, you know, it was pizza and salad every night. You know, your, your gourmet meals at camp. <laughs> and um, it was more about, for me, I, I really felt like this was going to hopefully, even if it didn't see the, the light of day, it, it was gonna be a great experience for me as an actor uh, to just kind of hone my craft for the next better thing that might come along. Um, you know, horror for everyone back in the day was kind of a jump off spot. Um, you know, you didn't question it. You know, as long as you didn't have to take off your clothes, you were good, right? Um, that does mean they didn't try. But, but I told you film's expensive and we had two weeks in the can, so <laughs> I could say no. You know, strip monopoly, yeah. That's why the door blew open. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's, that's that. <laughs> so, Amy, for the second one, was the casting process a similar situation? Like, did you know what kind of film you were getting into after the success of the first one? Well, I mean, I'd, obviously everyone had heard about the first one, but luckily we had a great budget, thanks to that. I mean, that movie made so much money, I couldn't even read numbers that big, you know? That, so um, it was much quicker. I think that they had the formula, so they just kind of had to plug in the people. Um, so I think we were all a little bit typecast, and I think I'd kind of went in and, you know, and they just sort of who I was kind of fit that role. So it wasn't as complicated or lengthy as Adrian's experience. Um, and I don't remember getting in a bus. I think I had my own car. <laughs> I, but we did shoot at a camp, and so we all stayed at a camp. But I, I remember the food being pretty good. <laughs> I'm sure it was. Tell us more. I, yeah, I think. Adrian, I think I'm sorry, it, I didn't mean to. Yeah, I think. <laughs> you I think. Know it is uh, what it is. Frank Mancuso goes at one point. He goes, you know. You're gaining a little weight. I go, no, I'm not. Well, you know what's your fault? This food is really good. <laughs> and then also in the um, in the dining hall in the morning, you know, because we'd shoot all night. So it, when we would wrap in the morning, it would be dinner. So at dinner, 
all the booze was there. So they had, you know, eggs with scotch, you know, and so it was all kind of backwards. Um, but we had a liquor budget. I bet you didn't. Whoa. <laughs> what was the liquor budget on? Uh... I never saw a bottle of wine anywhere. <laughs> anywhere. I searched. No. <laughs> no, there was other vapors floating around. But, right. but that was, uh, Sean made sure I was back in my little motel room at that point because he didn't want his final girl getting high. But I understand I missed the best parties with Betsy and neighbors who you probably all know about, right? Um, that that partied into the wee hours, yeah. But uh, no, but no budget for alcohol. <laughs> no budget for a wetsuit, but that's okay. <laughs> you would have seen it right through the blouse, so it's okay. <laughs> so speaking of, of part two, um, the well, death of Alex. Yeah. Sorry. No, please. I, do, well, I, I wore my own clothes. The film the other day, I'm like. I, those are my clothes. No. Those are my clothes. I had to buy my own boots. Those are my boots. Yeah. I had to because, seriously, you might have read this somewhere. It's absolutely true. When I got there that wonderful morning, the wardrobe lady goes, okay, here's a seven and a half. And I said, oh, I'm an eight. And she goes, put on two pairs of socks and stretch them. I don't think that's going to yeah. work. So fortunately, I got back to New York before we had to dig into those scenes, and I bought my own pair of boots, which is why I still have them, uh, <laughs> waiting for a great horror museum to call me. You got those boots, Alice? <laughs> Take note. It's on record. We can get the boots. Yeah. But I did. I, go, I went shopping for all my own clothes, because when I saw what they had in a Nothing fit. Well, they forgot about uh, wardrobe fittings. Yeah, I also think that at that time, you know, you just really wanted to be comfortable. And so the clothes that they would kind of have for you, I was kind of like, Ugh. so I said, no, I'll just wear this. No, I'll just wear that. So it kind of gave you a little bit of power in your character um, or just to feel comfortable as a young actor to have your own clothes. That's absolutely and, good you know, point. Your own style. Yeah, and, I'm it was us. We created the mm -hmm. character, basically. Yeah. That was something we were really curious about. We, we've talked about uh, the first two films have a very unique uh, tone to them that none of the other films have. And it, it feels almost like independent dramas of the time, as opposed to genre films and the things that part three, part five, these other films would be following formulas with characters that don't feel as realized. We were curious, was that writing or was that just you as actors bringing yourselves to these characters? It was just Amy. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it was also the the film, the style of the film, yeah. and the directors of 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 the film. I mean, they kind of had this really beautiful style to it, and then it just kind of got eroded. Yeah. I agree with that. I think the cinematography on the first two, mm -hmm. uh, the first one, I'm just blown away with it. The, the, every time I watch it, it's just so beautiful, that last scene, and mm -hmm. and then, you know, I'll never look that way again, immortalized with the <laughs> eyes over the sky, and it's just, it's just a beautiful piece of film, and, and the colors artistically. And then recently, Amy and I were at Mahoning Drive-In to watch it on the big screen, parts, uh, other parts of the series that I hadn't seen before. And I saw, I saw part five for the first time. <laughs> hey, Adrian, what do you think of part five? Ah. Uh, no, that, to that, that was, it's that, okay. oh, was it? No, yes, yes it was. Yeah. Yes it was. Anyway. It's okay. We were very impressed with our films. <laughs> and that's and why I won't do a show without Amy. <laughs> I mean, I got it. I've seen it now. Yeah. It was, it was really, I mean, yeah. It fell apart, didn't it? Kind of, sort of. The final girls carried their weight, but the story kind of got convoluted a bit. No, uh, I couldn't follow, I, but there I was a lot of vapor was, in the air. I couldn't vapor, much vapor, but I could not figure out who, even after I watched it, who was Jason? <laughs> you know? My favorite part is they pull his wallet out and he has a photo of himself in yeah. it, right? Like that's Wait, how we with find the out. hockey mask? It's the, it's the ambulance driver, and so they're like, yeah. well, you know, and then they fold yeah. out his wallet, and it's, a, it's like a 
you know, it's just like, you know. You don't have your headshot in your wallet? Yeah. I, was, I carry one in mine now, but I didn't at the time. It was amazing. I just feel like in some ways, I mean, this is probably really judgy, but I just feel like it, they got lazy and, mm. Um, mm. and they just kind of wanted to just kind of keep pumping them out just to have those big numbers with all those commas. There was nothing at of, stake. Yeah. The first one, everything was at no, stake. No, there was stake. You had dishes. stakes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You had they just, steak. They just, it was all about S-T-A-K-E. You know, at that point, just money. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And for the first one, I truly believe that everybody cared so much about finishing this movie. And for number two, I think that Steve, even though not my favorite person in the world. I think he was a great director in the respect that he carried that vision over to part two and didn't want it to make it even better than if he could uh, than part one. Yeah. Uh, then after that, I think Paramount kind of just went, <laughs> just like, you know, it's, who cares? Just get a script quickly yeah. because we have to get it out by Friday the 13th, you know, and, <laughs> and cash in on the weekend. Yeah. I do, I know the final girls from part three and four, and I think they did a tremendous job. I know mm -hmm. Joey Zita directed part four. Who directed part three? Uh, Steve oh, it was Steve. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I guess he was still invested. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to back up really quick. But I don't think yeah. it was all of the actors and the, maybe the director's fault. I think that what happened is it just got lazy in production. They just wanted to do lazy and quick. I don't mean to, you know... Um, throw anybody under the bus here. Certainly not. not. Really. Certainly not. It's our franchise. Yeah. I think everyone in this room can appreciate every Friday the 13th, quality be damned. Like, yeah. But I, I mean, we're desperately waiting for number 13 Aren't if they all, could ever right? get their act together, right? Absolutely. That's what bothers me. It's their act together or if we're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Can I back up and, and ask you about Alice in part two. This is the big controversial thing. And and from my understanding, well, you, she's you're on board, this you're like, I'm so excited. And then, not my favorite topic. But, to no, no. Up. But, but, I, but I, yeah. honestly, in a nutshell, I trusted the wrong people. I didn't know Alice was going to be offed. <laughs> um, Alice would not have shown up for that party. And... Uh, <laughs> And I never got a script, so I didn't know. You were improvising that entire scene. I should have writer's credit. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. 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 And it's a really beautifully like performed scene. It has such nuance and depth to it. And mm -hmm. I mean, where it goes is, you know, I was where it goes. The pain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. But it is what it is. And like I said this morning at some of the interviews, the same questions. The fact that I'm sitting here. 45 years later, from the time that we started shooting part one, right. it's literally 45 years later, and you all are here with me, it's a win-win, no matter what happened to Alice, you know? Right. I say she's, it was all a post-traumatic stress dream within a horrible nightmare, and she's in the woods drinking fine wine and painting, so there's no problems, <laughs> you know? But um, no, it's, it's just amazing and a little humbling to be sitting here still talking about something that ancient. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, again, I, I really do think that you both have the unique experience of having a lot of like authorship of your characters, where I don't think a lot of the other, you know, people, you know, down the line, part seven and eight, really probably just had to show up, hit those lines and marks, and we're yeah. moving on, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, I think that's the legacy that you you get to enjoy because you have so much invested in these characters and it really comes through. So that's why we're really excited to speak to both Thank of you. you. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Really nice. Very nice. Thank um, you. Let's see. Where are we? Yeah, we've got some time. What do you think, Maddie? Um, given that this like cycle for uh, horror now is kind of conventions and other things outside of uh, the, the actual process of making films, I'm really curious what your relationship to horror is at this point. Do you enjoy genre films? Do you enjoy horror films? When you were making these films, had you, did you enjoy horror films going into this? The Exorcist just ruined me. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. Raised Catholic. <laughs> Had a boyfriend down at Georgetown University. I knew the stairs, the steps. <laughs> Watching it like this. Um, never saw Carrie. Like after, uh, after. So show it. But actors will act as long as, you know, they have script, right? So it was like, yes, I can do this. Yes, I can. Fortunately, uh, or it all depends, but Tom Savini invited me into his magic cabin, and I got to see how the genius worked and the magic of special effects and how incredible the artistry is behind it. And being an artist, first and foremost, I always thought that that was my calling, still is. Um, that's where I gravitated all the time. If you wanted to find me, that's where I was in watching him create. And so after that, I would watch horror movies with a very discerning eye. And it, and it would ruin all the scares, right? <laughs> so I was fine with that. But horror, it, to me, is more about the, the relationship you have with other people watching it. To me, that's what always... I enjoyed about it the roller coaster and not knowing what's coming next and and that when it's finished that you all survived it together you know so that aspect uh, in terms of watching horror now if somebody tells me there's a great horror film you should see it yes I will definitely do that but otherwise I'm in my studio painting that's the truth yeah yeah uh, Amy how about you do you have a has it um, evolved, I suppose? What? Has, it, has your relationship to horror evolved since you've been, yeah. you know, kind of celebrated? I know that's a weird thing to say, <laughs> but within the horror community, are you more, a, 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 like, dialed into what's going on in the horror spaces? Um, the, w what has dialed me in is you guys. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I'd say that the my passion for, for horror is really... My, my relationship with all of you guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, when I first started this, I'm like, what? Who are you guys? <laughs> and uh, okay. and then over the years, I mean, just to be able to see the passion and the knowledge of um, what you guys hold, I think, oh my God, I could never, I, I, I have so much catch up to do, so I kind of live vicariously through you. As far as the fun and experience, it's really about being with somebody else during a, a horror film. I'm not a huge horror person. I'm not really a huge... TV person, so um, I kind of just follow your lead, honestly, um, and then just fight for my survival that way. <laughs> so both of you have done some voice work as well. Um, is there a, a different mentality to get into that space to do that voice work, even if it's the same character from the film version? Well, I, I did, um, when I ended sort of my on-camera career, I ended up doing voiceovers for, you know, probably five years. And I, it was so freeing to me to just have a microphone and to be in, like, normal shoes and not wardrobe and no makeup. It just felt free, even when I was reading copy for, like, a telephone company. It just felt so much, um, I, I, just, I love it. I absolutely love it because I don't have to worry about hitting marks and things like that. Um, so that was my experience with doing voiceover work. And so sometimes people will call me and ask me to do some on camera and I'm going, oh my God, it's so tedious. <laughs> just, just let me phone it in literally. And so that's why this, yeah. this, this film with James Sweet. And yeah, the Jason Rising, uh, if you haven't seen it, I think you'll have an opportunity tonight maybe. Um, uh, yeah, it's a voice voice work is wonderful. That's a voice the studio the voice studio saved me actually because after I had the stalker after part one came out, uh, that's what I did. I went into the voiceover world where I felt safe. I felt nobody knew who I was there. You know, there weren't any scary people who were going to come out and get me there. And like Amy said, ponytail, no makeup, and a pair of jeans, you're done. You know. And uh, I, I looped on films and TV series, which is so much fun, which if you don't know what it is, you're replacing multiple voices and sounds in one film or one TV show. And uh, I enjoyed 
the fact that I would have lunch with the director and the rest of the group, they'd take us out, we'd have fun, we'd go back to the studio, have more fun, and you never knew what you were going to do that day. You just, it was all improv, which, as you know, I was very good at. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and then I did something that scared the hell out of me, which was I narrated an audio book, my first audio book, which was Grady Hendrick's The Final Girl Support Group. And I don't know why I said yes, except the fact that it was so challenging and it was going to be something I hadn't done before. And I thought it was in my wheelhouse. And it was right after the pandemic. And I had no producer. And they promised me a producer. And it was just the guy in the booth and me. <laughs> and it's like, oh, my god. And London was. England was somehow involved, and they were supposed to give us notes, and they couldn't give us notes in time. But anyway, it was amazing because I did every friggin' character in yeah. the book. You're playing essentially every Which, final girl. <laughs> for me, is really tough because just doing me is hard. <laughs> and to keep all these other people straight, I had to highlight in different kind of uh, highlighter colors is what kept me straight. But that, uh, I feel, is an achievement to, to, to get through that book. And I've gotten so many wonderful uh, people come up to me, and I'm not expecting it to ever be about the you know, final support group, and there it is. And so I owe a lot to Grady Hendrix. He found me. He dug me again. I'm hard to find. I live in the boonies in Oregon with no cells. And so it's a tough find, but he found me. I, I love that performance. Okay. I, I, I did not realize that. it was your first, and that is a yeah. huge thing. I mean. You know, um, short of like video games or other things that have like 30 hours, performing an audiobook is a huge thing. In, in seven days, I believe it was. Yeah. Seven. Amazing. Yeah. I it, know. Go get that audiobook. It's, uh, it is yeah. wonderful. I don't get anything from it. It's just that I think it was cool. <laughs> Go appreciate it. It's another bucket list for me. You know, that's what, when you get to this age, it's all about the bucket list, you know? <laughs> so. so, what do you uh, both have, have planned for the future? And, and we're really curious about the, the franchise. I mean, it seems Jason like... Jason never dies. Yeah, we're so close to a TV series, apparently, all these other things, and uh, there is such a legacy now. It seems like we're at a critical mass. It's got to break at some point. I have the first four scripts in my hand. How were they? <sighs> okay, that's all you have to say. My heart breaks is all I can say. Oh, geez. Yeah, I was going to be playing somebody else who was going to be very cool. Um, <laughs> but A24 broke up with Brian Fuller, and they've got another crew of people who I don't know, so I doubt it's going to be something that I'll be hearing from, you know. So, you know, uh, uh, but... Back to the drawing board. Back to the drawing board. You're going to start board. around... Friday five, and then just go there. And yeah. Skip over the beginning again. It's it's all good, you know. I get more time to paint. I'm good with that. And, and more time at home, you know. And the fans are filling the void. I mean, you well, you both are yeah, in the, the fan so, films. This is such a blessing. Yeah, isn't it? yeah. And we're so happy you're here. I'll just, and it's it's such a treasure to just be able to talk to to both of you about all this and. Yeah. A lot of you have become our family. It's we see you over and over again, you know, and. You travel to faraway places that we happen to be. So it's an amazing thing. And we really do appreciate it because it's kind of like full circle time. You know, it's like we get to hear about all the things that we didn't before there was social media. Yeah. You know, yeah. we had no idea how we'd done. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's so true. Well, we've got a little bit of time left, and I, I did want to open up to the floor for a Q&A. Um, yeah, I'm going to come down with the microphone, and we'll kind of just go from there. But um, yeah, raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Hey, how are you? Good, good. What's your name? Mike. Mike, Mike what's your question? Um, well, for both of them, oh, um, one question I have is when you were both filming those movies, was there a particular really scary part for you personally that had come up during the filming that like got under your skin for a scene you were about to do. I bet for Amy, it might have been towards the end in the cabin when she's with Paul and Muffin, and um, Jason's going to come right through the window, and you can't react till he does. 
You were right about that, Mike. Oh, okay. <laughs> but you know what? Didn't we cheat? You cheated, right? Because we talked at my table about that. Uh, no. <laughs> you said, when you asked me, when I asked you a question about the film, you said, wait till we're in the room. And then you told Adrian, don't tell him anything. I did. And I didn't. <laughs> he tried to get me to give the answer. Um, so yes, let's see. I'm going to say there were a couple of them. Um, the whole night we shot the fight scene on the beach was was a tough one because you couldn't get it wrong. You know, it was it was choreographed like a ballet. Thirteen notes: Betsy do this, Adrian do this, Tommy do this, because we were working with a real machete on the beach. And uh, oh yeah, and everything that you see really happened because Betsy ahead of time. She said, I'm not pulling any punches, and the camera sees everything, so you'd better not pull any either. And I appreciate it, because I watch that film and I cringe. I mean, that scene especially is like, ow, it still hurts to watch it, because I, it, feel, it, it was so real. <laughs> it was real. And, uh, but she got it too, you know, she, <laughs> she got it too. And then the other one that was uh, not necessarily frightening, but just challenging was the last time we shot the scene in a canoe. I only had two takes. And the light, it was so important that in morning light, and the first scene, first time I fell out of camera range, they had to blow me dry and then get back into the canoe and pretend I didn't know or not, uh, not anticipate the cold water or that someone was coming behind me. And uh, we achieved it, so all is good. Amy, uh, yeah. Yeah, so as Mike said, yeah. <laughs> it was coming through the windows, but it, the hard part of that scene is, um, you know, having to be all calm when Muffin comes through the door, right? And then hearing the high speed camera go, and then basically everyone go, okay, cue the monster, come through the window. And I'm like, ah, Muffin. <laughs> and then, you know, ha being grabbed from behind. And then also, even though it was kind of choreographed, you know, I didn't know my head was going to hit. And, and we ended up having to shoot that scene three different times. And it was really, really, really stressful. And I remember the, um, the director, Steve Miner, said, hey, you know, it's a Sunday, you know, I'll take you to lunch at this like fancy place. And I was like, oh, wow, that's so nice. And then, you know, here, you want something to drink? Yeah, sure, I'll have a drink. Yeah, it's lunchtime. And then he goes, oh, by the way, we're going to shoot that scene again. <laughs> I was so mad. <laughs> I was so angry. Like He was trying the tender approach. I know. And you know what? And he knew, like, that was not the way... I mean, I wish he had just said, I mean, I'm mad right now. Even though I'm about it. Like, Got me I, here I under like false you know, like, pretenses. False yes. And, uh, but yeah, that was a Man, terrible situation. In <laughs> back in the 80s. You got a question for us? I have a question. So, so oh, sorry. Uh, so in the first film, there's a scene with a snake. Do you have any kind of, like, that seems like that would be scary to me, but, but, no. but that was a live snake though, right? It was a live snake. Snakes don't bother me. Here's the thing. <laughs> When I first saw the rat under the bed with Amy, uh, I freaked. That is my, honestly, you want to get me out of a room? I shouldn't tell you this because I know no, everybody's going to come. No, I'm a rat phobia, phobia. Me too, and I think it comes from New York City. The rats were this big <laughs> on the subway tracks. And as a young kid, I used to say I freaked out with rats. Ah! Have you seen the big rat in the hallway? No. <laughs> Do not send him my way. No. But uh, snakes... For some reason, not so much, you know, it was a, a garden snake. The fact that they killed it was horrible, absolutely horrible. And nobody, uh, you know, the actors were like, we're not even going to be in the room when it happens, you know. And he, he goes, oh, no, you're going to be in the room when it happens. But uh, Harry would not do it. I was, yeah. Who, no. who ultimately the, killed it? Sean him? did the Sean. deed. He, he had his house double mortgaged. He was going to kill a snake. <laughs> it's, it's you or me, snake. <laughs> it's right. Basically what it came down to. Well, we that rat that we had, Please, that, was, yeah. that was in the budget on your meal plan. <laughs> What was the movie? The Baby, baby Jane. Baby Jane? Isn't that? Uh, the Rat on the Platter? Ah! That was one of the first movies I ever saw as a kid at a drive-in, mind you. 
nightmares for days or nights, <laughs> days and nights. I, oh, that's, I did not like that scene. And of course I've watched it since and it's like, you know, but at, at the time, it's all about the illusion, right? It's, yeah. Oh, no, that's, I hated that movie. <laughs> you mean. <laughs> Rosemary's Baby. Ooh. We have uh, a couple more questions baby. we can do. Is there anybody here? Let me see. Oh, here we go. So, in the original movie, um, Kevin Bacon had this, in my opinion, a horrible line where he talks about how the wind shifted 180 degrees, and I've never seen a calmer lake in my life. Written by Victor Miller. <laughs> was there anything in either of your films that you thought, this is just really stupid? Why are they making me do this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Betsy was so funny at one of the shows. It was, I remember the show because they actually videotaped it at Scarefest 2008 or 9 before the next Friday was coming out. And uh, Victor Miller was sitting a few seats down, the whole panel of us. And, and somebody asked her a question about the script, and she goes, It was a piece of shit. <laughs> and I go, Betsy. Victor is sitting right there. And she goes, he knows it was a piece of shit too. <laughs> and that's basically, you know, it was such a thin script that that monologue was not going to go out of the script. It was the only monologue in Friday the 13th, you know, between him and the dreams, uh, trickles of blood. You know, that was in somebody's mind, you know, high art. So uh, <laughs> that, it's hard to surpass that, I must say. The strip monopoly scene actually was written like the day before we did it. That was not even in the script. Those were additional blue pages because we needed more time on, on screen. We needed filler. Uh, we needed more relationship buildups, you know, so you care more about us. But um, yeah, so much for that. <laughs> Good questions, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, Amy and Adrian, thank you again. This is uh, this has been a great time to just get caught up, caught up with you all, and and um, we want to invite all of our friends, of course, to go if you haven't yet see these folks, and um, yeah, get some autographs, talk some more stories about yeah. different things. Um, we're so excited you'll be here all weekend, and yeah, yeah. we're excited too. Yeah. It's, it's a good group of people here. They really care. It's all about passion, isn't it, in the horror genre? It's all about the family, and these people really seem to care. Good group. I agree. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Really You're the best. It. You know that, right? Yeah. Best fans ever. Friday the 13th fans. The best. Round of applause one more time for Adrian and Amy. Thank you so much. Happy Friday the 13th. Yeah. Have a great day and have a good cocktail. Yeah. It's in your budget. <laughs>